Am I connected or not? Okay. Yeah, just have a seat, please. We're going to start the uh, panel on rural road safety. My name is Brian Jonah, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of CARSP, and uh, I'm going to be the moderator of this session. Just a couple of announcements first. Um, before I introduce the, the panelists, I want to state that uh, all the questions for the panelists will be held to the end of the session. They'll do their presentations first. Um, we'll be uh, entertaining questions both from the floor here as well as from people who are uh, on Zoom. And uh, their, uh, people on Zoom can actually submit their questions using the uh, Q&A function. And uh, we ask people in the room here to uh, come up to a microphone to, uh, to state their question. So I just wanted to mention that, uh, as has been said before, I believe that uh, this is the first time we've had a conference in Northern Ontario. And uh, a lot of the Northern Ontario cities uh, have big rural areas that are part of the city. The mayor mentioned that uh, this is the case for Sudbury, and I know that uh, Ottawa is the same. In fact, I think Ottawa has one of the largest, if not largest rural areas in a, uh, in a city area. So I'm going to introduce our first speakers. Um, they're, they're doing a tag team match here. And um, Jesse Hopkins has over 16 years of experience in road safety uh, infrastructure and has gained uh, extensive industry knowledge with respect to the products specified, installed, maintained uh, on Canadian roads. He's conducted uh, roadside uh, safety training sessions, seminars, and symposiums across Canada to a variety of audiences, including contractors, engineers, designers, and politicians. His topics of expertise include roadside safety hardware, proper installation and maintenance techniques, product inspection, ramifications of aging hardware, and crash worthiness. Mr. Hopkins is currently the co-chair of the Ontario Roadside Infrastructure Coalition and uh, the uh, Ontario Road Builders Association Highway Safety Systems Subcommittee. Over the last uh, 10 years, Mr. Hopkins has worked with various roadside uh, road agencies, including the uh, Ministry of Transportation of Ontario, acting as a resource of roadside uh, safety product knowledge. Uh, Mark Ayton, the other speaker, is uh, a licensed professional engineer in Ontario for four decades of highway design and construction experience. Prior to joining Road Safe, uh, sorry, Safe Roads in uh, 2009, uh, 2018, Mark worked for the Ontario Ministry of Transportation, where he developed and implemented many construction standards, design guidelines, uh, design policies, uh, design manuals, technical presentations, and training sessions for MTO. Um, from 1999 through uh, 2018, Mark represented Ontario as an associate member of AASHTO Technical Committee on Roadside Safety and continues to be an active participant in with the uh, Transportation Research Board Roadside Safety Design Committee. Um, and uh, Mark uh, works in conjunction with the Safe Roads Research and Development Team and develops and crash tests roadside safety and physical security products in Ontario uh, and the US. So uh, I ask uh, Jesse to come up. I believe you're, uh, you're starting off and uh, I guess Mark is gonna join him as well. I've been told I gotta speak really close to the mic. Is that coming in okay? Okay, I know I'm gonna get a kink in my neck. Still okay? There we go. Thank you. Uh, it's really great to be uh, here in person again uh, after the last two years doing nothing but Zoom meetings. And a uh, little known fact, uh, it's actually great to be here up in Sudbury. I grew up here as a kid in the, uh, in the 60s. Little known fact is, uh, you know, Apollo 16, the astronauts uh, practiced here before going to the moon. So a great little story there to look into. Anyway, so uh, we're gonna talk about strengthening roadside protection on rural roads. I'll go to the next slide. We're going to talk about uh, basically safe roads engineering. Our vision is safer roads through practical solutions. Roadside design protection policies, guidelines, and standards should be data driven using collision data, in service performance evaluations, crash testing, and crash prediction models. We're going to talk a little bit about our uh, 2021 legacy roadside safety hardware crash testing study that was partially funded by Transport Canada. So, a little bit on uh, statistics. 
uh, this this graph here, I think people, I know we first generated this when I was still with MTO. I, I like to, uh, we've added some of the uh, statistics uh, for 2019 and 20 on here. And what, you, what you'll see is going back from 1975, how the persons killed uh, continues to go down. So we're kind of at a, a flat area right now, just uh, slightly less than uh, 600 per year. I, I hear the numbers have gone up during COVID, which seems kind of strange with, uh, you know, I remember last year driving into Toronto where there'd be like no one on the road. So it seems kind of strange how the numbers, I hear they've gone up. I haven't seen the latest numbers. I know they've definitely gone up in the US. But I mean, that's you know still a great trend that we've come down that way, and then you'll, you'll see there is the population of Ontario. So in 1975, it was uh, you know just over eight million people, and now we're up uh, almost 15 million. So anybody who lives in the Greater Toronto area knows that everybody's on the roads down there. It's highly congested, uh, but you know our fatality numbers keep going down, and a lot of the reasons for that we've got across the top there some of the innovations that have been implemented over the years. You know, concrete median barriers. I mean, they didn't start being used until 1977 here in Ontario, energy absorbing terminals, shoulder rumble strips, so on and so forth. And then on the regulatory side and the vehicles, because all, all these things have to work together, education, engineering, infrastructure, vehicles, you know, 1976 uh, seatbelts weren't mandatory in vehicles at that. I mean, that's when they became a law in Ontario that you had to wear a seatbelt. And we've had pretty good success here in Ontario with, with uh, seatbelt. Graduated licensing in 1994, truck speed limiters, ban on cell phones. I mean, you still see how many people are still on their, hand, on their, on their cell phones. So all these things work together to help drive those numbers down. And not one thing you can point to, but all these things work together. And on the infrastructure side, I mean, it takes years for things to change and, and get implemented and constructed over time. Just on the, on the data side, uh, what, what you see here in the top, I gotta get my, Directions right, top left. You'll see that's uh, that's out of the U.S. I, I really like how they report their data down there. Uh, that's from the FARS data place, which is the most harmful event when they when they go through and and publicize their their data. So uh, this is for roadside obstacles, and and what they show there is they actually go into the data and figure out what was the most harmful event, and and they're showing here that you know forty nine percent involved trees and they're showing that traffic barriers and we're going to be talking about traffic barriers are about nine percent now the ontario data down in the bottom center there i just pulled that out of the uh the 2018 ontario road safety annual report and that's the first event now the police are recording up to four events in a in a, in a, in a you know in, a, in the accident report form and this one's a little little misleading because they're showing here that uh, you know your guide rail across the bottom there i think i'm having a hard time seeing this up here it's about 30, 30 something percent versus 9% in the US, but they're also showing, you know, trees are down around 9%. I know trees are a lot higher than that. And I know when I used to really dive into the, you know, do the data dive at, at MTO, you get to see all the four events and actually get the police reports. So you had a much better handle as to what was going on. So that's what I really love to see is, is, is better data. So the top Top right, that's some more US data that's, that's showing you know, the difference between urban and uh, rural roadway uh, fatalities. So a lot of information that's available online. We've got two test facilities, uh, one just outside uh, Barrie. We're gonna be showing you some results, some tests there that we did last, uh, last summer with, uh, again, with Transport Canada. And then we've got a second facility up in Georgina, up near uh, Lake Simcoe. So we've been doing a lot of work with the Ontario Provincial Police, Toronto Transit Commission, um, and various roadside safety product manufacturers and northern infrastructure products. Everyone hear me okay? I'm close enough to the mic. Perfect. My name is Jesse. Um, I guess on my end, thank you very much for, for having Mark and I up here. Um, we had a nice drive up. We carpooled together. We don't get to spend a heck of a lot of time together. So four hours in a vehicle talking road safety for us was thrilling for others that might not seem as exciting, but no, it was great to, to drive up here, talk road safety, and uh, I'm just really happy to meet some more of the folks here today from CARSP. So Mark and I are involved with so many other associations, not just in Canada, but all over North America, that uh, it just seemed strange that neither one of us had been involved with this. So this, uh, this is fantastic. Thank you very much for having us. 
Um, addressing this slide, I'm hoping some of the folks in this room have heard of MASH before, um, not the old TV show, but an acronym standing for the Manual for Assessing Safety Hardware. Um, so over the past five to 10 years, there's been significant changes to provincial guidelines here in Ontario, uh, to standards and specifications for roadside safety hardware. You might just drive around and just notice that there's, there's a lot of new stuff out there. And that's the kind of stuff that's very exciting to us. So MASH is a uniform guideline that's used when crash testing roadside safety hardware. And I guess with this slide, the one takeaway on our end is uh, the huge change in vehicle demographic from the older crash test standards of NCHRP 350 um, to today, which uh, you know right now we're dealing with MASH 2016. So we've got an increase in vehicle weight of a small car, which uh, it's about on average 34% from the old surrogate vehicle used in crash testing to what we use today, um, which you know that, that changes impact severity. You make a vehicle heavier your impact severity is going to go up. And then when it comes to the pickup truck, I won't go into great detail. This is actually a, an hour long lunch and learn session I typically host that I'm trying to pop into one slide. Um, but with the pickup truck, we've got about a 14% on average increase in, increase in weight. Uh, we do have a higher center of gravity. And then uh, we're also dealing with larger occupant space. So as, you know, as our vehicle fleet evolves, so too should our roadside safety hardware. So we did uh, six system tests, uh, again, partially funded with uh, Transport Canada, and uh, we're only going to show uh, a couple of them here today, which are sort of tied to rural safety. Uh, we'll show you a link at the end how you can get this report and, uh, and get the videos. So we did a uh, oversized stop sign, very typical rural Kings Highway, um, but we did a 90 degree test. So the vehicle, not the vehicle that's coming to a stop from the side street, it's the vehicle departing the main highway and then hits that sign at a 90 degree angle, which is what most signs aren't even tested at. So that's what we were trying to replicate. We did the, uh, the test at 80 kilometers an hour with a small car. And the key thing is we did this at a 1.5 meter height from the bottom of the, from the ground to the bottom of the sign. All crash testing is showing us that we should always have a minimum 2.1 meter clearance to the bottom of the sign. But most design guides out there now for installation of signs are still quoting that uh, 1.5 meters. And the other, the, the last note here, it just says that uh, it's wooden undrilled six by six sign support. So this might shock you, but sometimes roadside safety devices are not installed as per specification. And if you install a wooden signpost at the side of the road, anything uh, in terms of dimensional lumber greater than a four by four should be weakened at the base. But we noticed a lot of posts aren't weakened. We probably saw a bunch just even on the drive up here. So moving forward, hopefully we can see it. Uh, we have a crash test. I think on that one, we almost took out our drone with the, the sign flying through the air. Um, but as you can see from this crash test, drive, car, car drives through, the signpost breaks, but the aftermath is what's important. And, uh, and understanding that based on MASH testing criteria, uh, between the roof crush being greater than 102 millimeters and the windshield deformation being greater than 76 millimeters, this six by six wooden signpost that has uh, no hose drilled at the base and 1.5 meter mounting height did fail um, based on MASH criteria. So we do see these things all over the place. And we just wanna, you know, through this crash test report, make folks aware that it actually doesn't meet um, the crash test guidelines that were laid out. So we also did the, uh, the legacy uh, three cable guide rail system uh, that's used throughout Ontario. We, uh, we've implemented a new MASH system of uh, cable guide rail back in 2016. This system isn't being installed anymore, uh, but there's still at least 2000 kilometers on Ontario highways still. And over the next you know, years, it will start to be uh, you know, phased out and replaced with, uh, with updated products. So most MASH testing on highways is actually tested at 100 kilometer an hour. And what we decided to do, that stop sign, we did it at 80. We knew it did not stand a chance of passing at 100. So we dropped it down to the regulatory speed. That's what we hit it with. Same thing with the cable here. This system was, uh, this legacy system was developed by MTO back in the uh, late 1960s. Uh, it was a real workhorse of a system, very low cost. Um, and it's, uh, we, redid, we replicated the test from 1968, but we used a modern vehicle. We did the same speed, 80 kilometers an hour and a 25 degree impact angle. And you'll see the results. And just as a little audience engagement, just a nod of the head, everyone's seen this system out on the road, correct? We can see the, the six inch, eight foot wooden post. And we understand that we've got a three strand half inch cable and at either end, we have a, a one cubic meter concrete block that's providing anchorage. Okay. 
be brought. Oh, give me one sec. There we go. Can we see it there? Perfect. No problem. On the top left, that's actually the original test that was done uh, back in, I think it was 1968. Um, as you can see, watching the high-speed camera on the right side here, um, the truck gets right into the cable system. And again, this is a 5,000 pound pickup truck on our mash. And uh, we don't see even any kind of note of containment until it gets towards the end. And then it does blow right through the cable system. So this is our, our cable guide rail system being impacted with just an updated vehicle. So um, if we look at the results of this, uh, we got a vehicle penetration and override. And if you don't understand crash testing, if you drive through a longitudinal barrier system like this, that would be considered a failure. So normally when we're doing this kind of talk, we would show you how it, a modern system performs versus the uh, versus the legacy system. Uh, so this is another uh, workhorse system, steel beam guide rail with a rub rail or channel at the bottom. You've probably seen a lot of this mostly in the uh, in the greater Toronto area. And what we did here is, uh, I mean, this system is normally, and I'm going to switch to Imperial units, normally installed at about a 31 inch uh, top of rail height. Over time, when they resurface the roadway, sometimes they don't adjust the rail up. But the tolerance allows it to, you know, to decrease that height down to about 27 inches. Uh, that photo there is actually near where I live. That's at about 24 inches right now. We know that definitely won't work under these types of tests. So what we did is we tested this system with a 27 inch uh, mounting height at 100 kilometers an hour uh, per mash. And as you see the crash test here, as the pickup truck drives into the uh, steel beam guide rail section with channel on the bottom, we have a penetration ride through. And then, you know, on our end, on the, the R&D side, we get a, a rotation like that of a vehicle. That's a, that's a pretty exciting and makes for a spectacular video crash test. Uh, but this is also a, a guide rail system that's all over Ontario roadways. So it, if there's one thing I could kind of give as a takeaway from this, and it's one thing that I've been doing, speaking to groups all over Canada, is uh, you know the road safety devices are out there and they're out there to perform a, a, a pretty specific job. And uh, you know I just wanna make sure folks are more mindful of these devices that are out there. And I, I often joke and say, I'm gonna ruin your drive because now you're just gonna look at road safety hardware all the time. But, uh, and of course with this, we have a, a failure under MASH testing criteria. We had a, a penetration, we, we drove right through. Um, I guess, Mark, you're gonna do a recommendation here, but the, the one note I'm just gonna make really quickly is we do actually have the full report on all of this, everything that we had done with the six tests. And that's a report that we did send back to uh, federal government. And that is something perhaps we'd like to share on the, the CARSP website or something make available. And uh, yeah, that's interesting tests. I'll just add one more comment on that is uh, these MASH tests, they're supposed to represent like about an 85th percentile test. So they are, they are extreme. So, I mean, the hardware is working out there. They did meet the standard of the day, but the new hardware is obviously better. Uh, what we'd like to see uh, that we work with you guys is a timely release of expanded collision data. I know I used to have a lot better access when I was with the government getting data. Obviously, I'd like to have increased uh, access to it and more data. More data is always better, and I think everybody everybody realizes that. All new road safety hardware should be crash test latest criteria. That's what MPO does now. Um, every new product goes out on the road now has been tested now. In-service performance evaluations. Basically, what's working, what's not? Why didn't it work? And that's where the data can help us as well. Uh, legacy roadside safety hardware identified as poorly performing through collision data, in-service performance, crash testing should be prioritized for removal and or upgrading. Road authority asset management systems should be expanded to include condition and age of roadside safety hardware. Doing a lot of work with municipalities lately and their asset management system really doesn't track what the condition of their systems are. There's the link to uh, for the legacy report, uh, safe, saferoadsrnd.com. And uh, thank you very much for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Jesse and uh, Mark. Our next speaker uh, is going to be uh, Michelle Proyati. Uh, she is the head of uh, pre-contract traffic engineering at the uh, Ministry of Transportation of Ontario in the Northeast region. Uh, before joining the ministry, she earned uh, her Bachelor of Applied Science in Civil Engineering at the University of Ottawa. She is a licensed professional engineer in Ontario 
uh, with nine years of experience in uh, highway engineering. The last four years, she has worked as a traffic engineer uh, with the MTO in North Bay. So I welcome Michelle to take the podium. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me today. So today I'd like to talk about the common issues that we see on rural roads in north, uh, northeastern Ontario. So my presentation today, I'm going to cover the ministry's mission statement, the area that we look at in northern, northeastern Ontario, the types of highways we see in that region, operational performance reviews, and the common issues that we see come out of those reviews. So the ministry's mission statement is moving people and goods safely, efficiently, and sustainably across Ontario to improve quality of life and support a globally competitive economy. So this map shows the area of Ontario that we look at within Northeastern region. So the major com er, communities that we have include Sudbury, North Bay, Timmins, and Sault Ste. Marie. Our major highways are Highway 469, 11, 17, 144, and 101. So our Southern boundary depends on what highway you're on, because it's not a straight line. So if you're on Highway 400, our Southern boundary is Port Severn. And if you're on Highway 11, it's the Severn River. And to the West of our region, we are just about 125 kilometers west of White River on Highway 17. We also have a number of highways that run through provincial parks. So Highway 60 is an example, goes through Algonquin. Highway 17 goes through a number of uh, provincial parks as well, including Lake Superior Provincial Park and Pancake Bay. We have quite a few different types of highways within our region. So we have rural divided four lane freeways. An example is Highway 400, and these have grade separated uh, interchanges. We also have rural undivided four lane highways. Uh, Highway 17 is an example of that with controlled access. Rural undivided two lane highways like Highway 6 uh, make up a good portion of the highways that we do look at within our region. These have a number, number of features, including exposed rock faces. And finally, the fourth type of highway that we have within Northeast region is rural undivided two lane gravel highways. An example of that is Highway 553. And those are primarily used by logging and mining vehicles, but some of them do have residential um, on them as well. So, Operational performance reviews. The ministry uses these to establish, or the ministry has established a methodology to conduct safety reviews of corridors. And this is called a operational performance review. So the operational performance reviews are in depth studies of existing roads using safety principles with the, propose, with the purpose of identifying cost effective countermeasures that would improve road safety and operations for all road users. There are a number of tasks that are included within an operational performance review, stakeholder engagement and partnership with First Nations, office review, field investigation and identification of deficiencies. Development of recommendations is the final step in the process. So general issues that we see are excessive speeds, speed management through hamlets, a lack of passing opportunities, issues with the curvilinear alignment, a mixture of recreational and truck traffic, long distance uh, logging and mining trucks, and roadside safety. So we have a lot of the Canadian Shield. Uh, a lot of you would have seen that coming up, uh, anyone coming up from Toronto. We do have a lot of rock, trees, and water. <laughs> So common issues that are usually identified within OPRs when dealing with road segments. We have a lot of wildlife collisions. Unfortunately, Bambi, Bullwinkle, and Yogi don't understand not to cross the highway. 
We have access management that can be then that can co, uh, cause a problem um, if we have, if, for example, depicted in that picture there to the to the left. Um, we can have a segment that has a lot of access, which can cause some issues when it comes to getting people on and off the highway and their interaction with the through traffic. Other issues for road segments, we have steep slopes and roadside hazards. So steep slopes, they could be unrecoverable slopes and those are a safety concern. Deficient guide rail systems are also a safety concern. We also look at intersections uh, in Northern Ontario, in Northeastern Ontario in particular, um, Northwest as well. We do have a significant number of intersections on our highways. So intersection recognition is something we look at in the OPRs. Information signs may have legibility issues. Visibility of stop signs, could they could be obstructed. So clearing may be needed. Um, Placement of one-way signs, we do have our Ontario traffic manuals, and uh, sometimes signs uh, need to be updated to match those requirements. Gap selection can be an issue. Uh, with the requirement to cross the median in two stages, we see this on Highway 11 between North Bay and Gravenhurst. And safety selection of gaps on the side street. So again, trying to get onto the highway um, safely when you're uh, at a stop and you have a uh, hundred kilometer an hour traffic or more uh, coming through there. We have also seen insufficient tapers, deceleration lanes and acceleration lanes. Other common issues with intersections, we see uh, traffic conflict points. So particularly if you're looking, for example, um, in the one there to the top right, um, when you have that median crossover, you significantly increase the number of uh, conflict points that you're looking at. So that is a safety concern when we're looking at, um, again, in particular, uh, the intersections on Highway 11 come to mind. Skewed in intersections, geometry, those can pose problems with our sight lines, um, your gap selection, uh, and the, uh, all things associated with that. And we can have confusion over yield conditions within grade crossings and medians. So in some cases we've seen those gray, the median crossings there where they do have a stop bar, but it's a yield condition. So it can be a little confusing for some drivers on what condition it is they're supposed to do at that median crossing. And that's, uh, that's it for my presentation. Thank you again for having me. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Jeffrey Suggett. Uh, Jeff has uh, 22 years of consultant experience in the field of road safety, transportation planning, and traffic engineering. He's a senior manager in the transportation group at uh, SEMA Plus, providing service to the public and the private sector uh, throughout Southern Ontario in the area of transportation planning and traffic engineering. Uh, Jeffrey has a wide ranging experience on conducting environmental assessments, a stakeholder and public consultation, and having been an EA lead on uh, road construction projects uh, throughout Ontario. Uh, Jeff has successfully managed dozens of in-service road safety reviews and road safety audits on a variety of projects in, in Ontario and other provinces. Uh, his specialty areas include uh, school zones, transit, uh, truck operations, railway operations, uh, commercial vehicle freight movement, signs and pavement markings. Um, and Jeff has an extensive knowledge of the uh, Transportation Association of Canada geometric design guide for Canadian roads, the Ontario traffic manuals, and the, uh, the highway safety manual. So I asked Jeff to uh, come up and uh, do his presentation. I just confirming everybody can hear me okay. Excellent. So uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak today. Uh, my presentation really follows Michelle's presentation. Um, SEMA, our firm, uh, has done a number of those in, um, or I should say operational performance reviews, 
part of Retainer in uh, Northeastern Ontario. And what I'm going to be talking about today is some of the treatments that we have recommended as a result of those, those reviews that we've done. Next, looking, what do we do here to get to the next one? Perfect, thank you. Okay, so, all right, so in terms of my agenda for today, I'll just be spending a brief amount of time talking to you about, uh, first of all, best practices. What information do we use when we are evaluating uh, what would be the best treatments to put in place as a result of these operational performance reviews? We'll be also looking at some short-term treatments that are applicable to a uh, rural uh, safety, such as Northeastern Ontario and the extensive highway network that MTO operates on. I've got them grouped by road segments as well as intersections. We'll also be looking at what are some typical medium long-term recommendations, ones that are more involved, that are more costly, uh, when to implement those, and we'll be looking at some examples of road segments and intersections. So in terms of best practices and the MTO's operational performance review guidelines speaks to a number of um, documents that are out there that need to be referred to when coming up with uh, best practices. The MTO itself has released a whole suite of Ontario traffic manuals. You see a few of these on the screen regulatory signs, warning signs, pedestrian crossing treatments. We refer to those a lot when we're doing our work. Of course, uh, TAC, TAC's uh, Geometric Design Guide for Canadian Roads. Uh, there's the MTO Supplement to TAC, which we also have a look at. We also look more abroad, and the uh, United States has a wealth of online resources that uh, we use. There's the uh, Federal Highway Administration, which has a whole suite of documents that uh, have uh, excellent information in them. There's the NCHRP 500 series. These are guides that look at uh, a whole suite of treatments geared at specific types of crashes, crashes at intersections, speed related crashes, pedestrian related crashes. We refer to those. Another website, which uh, I really urge you to bookmark is the CMF Clearinghouse. This is a collision modification factors they are studies that have been published that look at the collision benefits of different treatments. We regularly refer to those. These are um, showing you research and anything from uh, sign enhancements, pavement marking enhancements, uh, to putting in a roundabout. And finally, uh, the ministry itself has the Operation Performance Review Guidelines. Uh, SEMA is in, currently in the process of updating those. And in the appendices of that document, there is another set of CMFs uh, that are specific to ministry roads. So we're going to start off with short-term treatment. So these are things that can be quickly done. Um, obviously, when you're out there in the field and you see things that are quick fixes, you want to get those uh, done as soon as possible. These are ones that are focused on intersections, and these are ones that have been shown to have uh, tangible safety benefits. First one is roadway identification sign enhancements. Obviously, when you're on a high-speed highway, uh, having advanced warning that you're coming up to a crossing roadway is beneficial. It uh, increases legibility for drivers and allows them to uh, avoid making those sudden lane changes. Improving this visibility of stop signs on crossing roads. Michelle referred to examples where the stop sign placement was an ideal you want to make sure that those are in the driver's cone of vision where they expect to see it. That'll increase their likelihood of obeying the requirement stop, as well as stop ahead signs. Putting those farther back on the road when you have limited visibility to the intersection, again, it increases their likelihood that they'll obey the requirement to stop, as well as very simple things. And um, is one of the things that we do when we do our operation performance reviews in Northeast Ontario is we actually go and visit the site in the middle of winter because in the middle of winter, you can have issues with snow banks. And so we look to see whether or not the snow blanks, snow banks are cleared. We make recommendations for keeping the site triangles and intersections free of snow banks, as well as in the summer when all of a sudden you get a bunch of growth, you get uh, high grass, you get uh, trees that are growing and now, now they're uh, in full leaf 
and suddenly you can't see around the corner. And so we recommend brushing in the summer. It improves visibility for vehicles approaching the intersection. Additional short-term recommendations, particularly the challenge that Michelle was referring to earlier when you have a divided highway that still allows access from the roads and all of a sudden you have a median in the middle and drivers are clear as to how, what they're to do. Uh, they're reluctant to go into that middle area. And so putting, first of all, one-way signs on divided highways when there isn't a median gap, as well as what we call a two-stage gap acceptance sign. And it gives the message drivers, you can do this, this turn onto the main highway in two stages, first going into the median when it's safe to do so, and then proceeding with your left turn as well as uh, looking at traffic control, changing, uh, changing the stop control from the side street to the major, major street when you're seeing that the volumes are actually uh, warranting a flip in traffic control. Uh, looking at road segments. Again, these are very simple things that can be implemented right away and we often recommend them. Oversized speed limit signs gives that emphasis to drivers that they need to uh, obey the speed limit Deer crossing signs, um, these, are, these are good to put in place. Obviously in Northeastern Ontario, you have a lot of wildlife collisions and looking for the areas where you're seeing those in the past and putting those warning signs along those sections of road, as well as things like improvements to pavement markings, provides that additional guidance at night. Now, now we're getting into things that are a little bit more involved, medium to long-term recommendations. Um, starting with uh, things that we've already heard from, from uh, Jesse and Mark on earlier in this presentation, slope flattening and shielding. Again, where you can get away with not putting in a uh, roadside barrier, if you can provide a, a slope flattening within the clear zone, gives that run out area for, for drivers. It's, it's uh, obviously not as costly as putting in a, a, a roadside barrier and we've recommended those in a number of places along uh, Northeast and Ontario highways. Again, though, where you can't uh, get away with uh, having that slope flattening and, and shielding steel beam guide rails, we've recommended those in a number of places, as well as in medians, uh, protecting uh, opposing traffic. Last of all, uh, breakaway hydro poles. Uh, we are recommending putting those in place again, where you need to have that hydro pole within the right of way but uh, you wanna make sure that as breakaway should a car hit it, uh, the, the severity of the collision is reduced. Also looking at road segments. So one of the simple treatments that uh, we are recommending along Ontario uh, highways is a fully paved shoulder. And again, when you have issues with drivers needing to pull off the road because of uh, mechanical issues, uh, other emergencies, having a fully paved shoulder that they can pull onto rather than going onto a gravel shoulder, it uh, improves their control as they are pulling off the highway. Last full thing, and this is uh, um, more in some of the Southern areas of Northeastern Ontario, where you have highways with a lot of access along the road. You've got issues with vehicles that are pulling into gas stations, restaurants, uh, you know, fast food areas. They're pulling into those areas. They're pulling out of those areas. And there can be a real disruption between uh, through traffic that is traveling at a relatively high speed and slowing, slowing traffic that is turning in and out into these access accesses. So as a long-term recommendation, we're recommending those areas, putting in a continuous auxiliary lane, it separates out uh, traffic pulling in and out of these accesses from the, the through movements and provides for a greater amount of safety. Uh, the final thing is looking at intersections, improvements to tapers, acceleration, deceleration lanes. Again, we've looked at a number of intersections where these are deficient. We've checked them in terms of uh, what TAC is telling us. There isn't sufficient uh, um, deceleration length for vehicles that are pulling off the main highway and slowing to make their turns onto these side streets. We've looked at those in turn, according to the standards and we're, make, we're recommending upgrades to the length of those. Illumination at intersections. Again, in, in rural areas, 
that illumination is critical. It provides the driver with notification. They are now approaching the intersection where they need to make that turn. Also gives them the awareness that there may be other vehicles at those intersections that are wanting to turn onto the main highway. And it gives them that increased recognition of what the intersection looks like. Again, is it, is it skewed? Are there lanes there that I need to be aware of? And so illumination, relatively uh, modest in terms of expense, but we can program that in in terms of medium long-term recommendations. And then the last one is advanced warning flashers where you're coming up to a signalized intersection on these highways. Again, when you are driving for dozens and dozens of kilometers along these highways, drivers are, are going to be surprised when they come up to a traffic signal and putting that advanced warning telling them that they are approaching those traffic signals gives them that uh, gives them that warning and and also improves safety at the intersection itself. So that is uh, it for my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Our final speaker for this morning is uh, Phil Landry. He's the Director of Traffic Services at the City of Ottawa. Phil has worked in the municipal government in Ottawa since graduating from the University of Ottawa in civil engineering in 1993. He's a licensed professional engineer in the province of Ontario and has spent the majority of his career in the transportation sector at the city, working in various areas such as traffic operations, traffic management, traffic safety and investigations, and project management. He has championed the development of the city's road safety action plan, the city's transportation system management plan, and most recently the implementation of the uh, automated speed enforcement program. So, Phil? I assume everybody can hear me? Great. Uh, so thank you for having me here today to, to present our road safety action plan. Um, and I'm just going to go through the plan at a high level just so you get an understanding of what it's at. And then I'm going to talk about how we're funding it um, and then focus specifically on rural areas in terms of what we're doing uh, to improve safety at the City of Ottawa. Um, so our, our action plan, the one we just uh, got approved by our council in 2020 or 2019, is our third generation. Uh, our first was around just uh, at the turn of the, the, the century at, in 2000. Uh, we did another one in 2010, 2011, and this is the third one. Um, and the theme is think safety, act safely. So in anything that we do in road safety, this is what we talk about. We want people to, to, to see when they see these words and see this, uh, this diagram that if you, if you think safety, you should act safely on our roads. Um, our vision is a comprehensive and proactive strategy for making our roads in Ottawa as safe as all users. And our goal is to reduce the average annual rate of fatal and major injury collisions by 20% by 2024. And we picked 20% uh, because we also want to make sure that the plan is achievable. I know that ultimately we want to be down to zero, uh, but the reality is, is, is that's not going to happen in the short term. Hopefully with you know, the advances we're doing in, in all the different fields that that will happen someday. Uh, but we want to ensure because in our first plan we had we had taken what Transport Canada had provided as 30 percent and when we didn't achieve that it was deemed as a failure even though we had done improvements um, so we wanted to make sure that that we re, that the goal that we we choose is achievable our ultimate goal is to be better than that uh, but we feel that uh, by the the plan that we've adopted uh, we'll be able to get to that so the the plan is based on a safe systems approach to um, to our roadways uh, where human life and health are prioritized. It's a shared responsibility between roadway providers, regulators, and users. We know that humans make errors and they, those errors shouldn't lead to deaths on our roadways or serious injuries. Uh, road safety requires a change in culture. And most importantly as well is that it's data-driven. So all the measures that we've, we're gonna be doing over the next uh, years is based on the data that we're, we're collecting. Uh, in Ottawa, we get about 15,000 collisions a year. Uh, so we have a, a big data set in terms of how and where these things are happening. So based on, on the data, we identified four emphasis areas. The first being vulnerable road users, which include pedestrians, cyclists, and motorcyclists. We have intersections. Uh, there's the rural roads, 
so, uh, and I'll speak to that a bit later, but you'll see that, that a lot of our, and most of our fatalities and serious injuries happen on those rural roads and our high risk drivers. There's also an overarching emphasis area, which is road safety culture. So again, it's, it's changing that culture of, of all the users, the designers. So we have a robust communications plan that uh, we're rolling out over the next four, five years. We're doing road safety audits on either new planned roadways, uh, rehabilitation of roads. Um, and also, which is unique, um, is we, we're also, we create a road safety training course. So this is a two-day course that all our engineers, designers, planners at the city of Ottawa, and also the consultants um, in Ottawa uh, are, have to take to ensure that they have a, an understanding in terms of what you need to be looking for from a road safety perspective. Because a lot of times you're so focused in one thing that it may create issues in other areas. So it's just to give that overall um, um, training so that they have an understanding and a better uh, understanding of that. So in terms of our budget, um, so in 2022, our budget was $7.2 million for road safety. Um, each of the different areas uh, have allocated funds. In rural areas, that's $2.25 million. So the question becomes, how do we fund that? Because prior to 2020, our budget was probably $1.5 million. And that had been the case for probably 10, 15 years. And this is where automated speed enforcement came in, into play. Um, so when we had our, our plan approved in 2019, we knew that automatic speed enforcement was coming down the pipe in terms of the province changing the regulations. So uh, through this, the road safety action plan, we have council approved that all net revenues from automated speed enforcement, or sorry, automated enforcement, so that it could include red light camera. Uh, we have school bus cameras as well in Ottawa that would fund our road safety program. So the net revenues, that's after the ASC and the and road safety operating costs are deducted, would be put into this fund. Um, last year, when we brought forward our automatic speed, automated speed enforcement program, we created a road safety reserve fund, and that's where all the funds um, go into, and that's what funds our road safety action plan. So as you can see in 2022, uh, we had the, the program itself, we piloted for a year eight locations, and those were located at schools. Um, you know, to the point we heard a bit earlier in terms of, uh, you know, the, it's, a, it's a money grab and cash grab like we heard, you know, back in the 90s, and that's why it sort of disappeared for 20 years. Our focus on automated speed enforcement is, is safety. So we, we purposely looked at schools. We identified schools where we had operating speeds over 15 kilometers on average um, over the speed limit. Uh, and so we piloted for, for a year, and we saw a reduction in operating speeds. We also saw better compliance to the to the speed limit, which makes the, the road safer. Uh, in that one year, we didn't have time to look at collisions just because usually it takes three to five years to see that, but we are monitoring that as well. And so last year when council approved the program, we expanded to additional 15 locations by the end of this year uh, with 20 to 25 locations for the next five years uh, moving forward. And we're focusing on schools. We also are looking at parks because we know a lot of, of people are in, in park areas. Uh, we're also piloting sort of high, higher speed roadways uh, because that's one concern, especially where you've got vulnerable road users that are in those areas. So as you can see, uh, by, we, by the time we get to 2025, um, our estimate is we'll have about $37 million. And that's going to make a big difference in terms of being able to make changes. Because as we all know, it's quite expensive to, to make uh, you know, real change on, on our roads. Um, and so especially when you consider the city of Ottawa. So everyone knows Ottawa is the capital of, of Canada, but people may not realize that 80% of Ottawa is rural. Um, and if you were to actually fit the cities of Calgary, Edmonton, Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver, it would fit within the city of Ottawa. We're about 80 kilometers wide um, and about 40 kilometers in, in depth. Uh, and like I said, 80% of our roads are rural. We have over 6,000 kilometers of, uh, lane kilometers of roadways in the city. Um, so when you do the math, we've got, you know, between 4,500 and 5,000 kilometers of rural roads, which could be either asphalt, um, gravel, uh, and those type of things. So when we looked at the data from, from a rural, rural roads perspective, um, we noticed that more fatal injuries, more fatal collisions are happening on those rural roads. Out of the 712 uh, major and fatal collisions in between 2016 and 2020, 22% occurred in rural areas. And out of the 121 fatal collisions uh, in that same time, uh, 44 occurred in rural areas. So when you look within the rural areas and the, the type of collisions we're seeing, 44% uh, are single motor vehicles. So those are people either, you know, 
uh, usually leaving off the side of the, uh, of the road. Uh, we have about 16, which is approaching or head-on collisions. Um, we have 19 at angle, and then you have rear end and turning movements, which are around just under 10%. So with this data, we've what we've done is we've created a, an action plan and sort of some countermeasures to try to address those issues. So the first thing we've done uh, and we've looked at is safety edges. So when, when the road normally gets paved, uh, but between the gravel and the asphalt, it's sort of a straight line. And the challenge as time goes on, ruts get created, and as wheels sort of deviate off to, the, or cars deviate off the side of the road, they get stuck in these ruts, and they try to overcompensate, either then going into the opposing direction, or they go on the shoulder. So safety edges, what they are, is we actually pave the road, and on the edge, instead of making a 90 degree angle, you make it a 45 degree angle. And the theory behind that is that then it's not, you, don't, you won't lose as much control of your vehicle um, and it won't feel like you're losing control of the vehicle. So we developed a process through the data to identify and incorporate these safety edges on resurfacing and roadway projects. Our first phase was to, because this is fairly new, so we worked with the construction, um, construction groups to pilot and evaluate the constructability of these safety edges. And this was done last year and the plan is through our resurfacing program um, this year is to implement some along these corridors where we're seeing these type of uh, single motor vehicle collisions. Um, and then the second phase will be to evaluate it over time in terms of how the safety edges are working as well as um, the, from the collision perspective. Another issue we have in Ottawa is uh, skewed intersections. So these are sweeping curves um, that we see out in the rural areas. So the majority of the traffic follow that curve. Um, and then you've got the two sort of side intersections that, that meet at the, at, the edge of, at the ends of the curves. So we identified, we created a, a safety ranking index that was based on the data. Um, with, with, uh, in terms of that, we identified some short-term actions uh, where we saw, especially at high uh, locations where we're having a lot of collisions, um, as well as some longer-term conceptual design. And the plan would be to build those over the next few years, try to coordinate with works that are already going on in the area. So here's one example of a skewed intersection in the south of the city. So again, the majority of the traffic was uh, traveling along the curve. As you can see at the top end, you can see the, the issue in terms of motors that are coming off the, the side street, if you wanna call that, and the curve. Uh, there was confusion sometimes in terms of who had the right of way. Um, there was also issues in terms of visibility with people driving up the roads. So what we ended up doing was actually closing one of the, uh, the inside part of the curve. So cars that were coming in the past would have to, would use that curve would actually come up to the the t intersection down at the bottom of the of the uh, of the photo here and we use flex posts and paint uh, so that was implemented uh, last year and it's it's led to uh, reduced uh, at least in the short term uh, number of near misses and collisions and and the community feedback we get from folks is that it's a lot safer than it was in the past the plan ultimately is to come back at some point in the future and do some um, some major changes with construction but again this has solved the problem here um, here's another intersection. Uh, again, this one's a little different in terms of uh, at the bottom of the screen, the straight road going up is actually gravel, so it's very low volume. Uh, and then the, the road coming into the, the curve at the top is just a short segment between a, um, a road that's just down the road. Uh, so the volume is fairly low. But again, um, the issue here is the right of way was for folks on the curve and there was um, confusion and, and we had some collisions with cars not yielding. Um, so what we ended up doing here is we actually closed that that access road and we made um uh we made the the curve the only road that was with traffic allowed so you can see at the at the at the curve site you can see the the signs we installed at the intersection just about half a kilometer down the road we put some road closures now there was concerns with fire and uh, paramedics that they wouldn't be able to access that area so we put flex posts uh, so that if there was an emergency they could access that um, and similarly we closed the um the gravel road now, in the long term, uh, and this this was one of these intersections we've already started the design on, is we um, we're implementing a T intersection here, so we're actually going to get rid of the curve, and hopefully that gets built next year. So some of the other things we're looking at is uh, enhanced delineation on horizontal curves. Um, so here you can see prior to there was no chevrons, and we added some uh, after. Um, this is an example of upgrading our rural stop signs. Uh, so just making larger signs. Uh, you see on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, although it's, we're a little zoomed out, we had a multi-way stop there, but uh, what we added was some flashing lights uh, with solar panels just to create a bigger conspicuity of, of, the, of the area. Uh, we also look at exponential space markings. I'd say prior to 2020, 2020, we probably had about eight or nine locations, and every year that grows. Uh, and, and the challenge in the rural areas in Ottawa is 
is that uh, we see um, you have long stretches of roads where there's no stop signs and all of a sudden something comes up and, and drivers aren't expecting that. Um, we also do proactive data driven for shoulder maintenance and priorities using the FMI collision data. So again, it's, it's getting our, our roads folks to go out and, and pave the, uh, the edges and also add some more gra gra granular material. Uh, education, that's a big component. And this, um, this is going back from, to about 2005, but this was probably our most successful education campaign. The challenge with education campaigns is hard to measure how effective it's been. Uh, with this one here, we're, in a, we're having issues in the rural areas on certain corridors with wildlife. Uh, so we created a program called Speeding Costs You Dearly. Uh, and what we found was um, between, we implemented in 20, 2005, and between 2006 and 2010, we saw a reduction of 38% of, of vehicle uh, wildlife collisions. We're also, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we talk about rural road and we're doing a road safety campaign. So I've got a short video. Sudden turns, works. soft shoulders, hidden intersections, and crossing wildlife. Ottawa's rural roads are challenging as is. Add speed, alcohol, or drugs, and they become deadly. Think safely, act safely. A message from the City of Ottawa and Safer Roads Ottawa. So again, this is an example of what we're doing in the rural areas. We also have the same type of messaging for other areas and always ends with think safety, act safely. Um, and lastly, as I just finished, this is sort of something that's unique in Ottawa and that's I think gaining ground in other areas uh, in jurisdictions, Ontario. But back in 2017, we created the Fatal Collision Review Committee. And this is a multi-agency initiative uh, under the Coroners Act. What we were finding is back when we were having fatal collisions, the coroner would be there, the police would be there, we'd go there. Uh, we weren't really talking to each other. So we actually got together um, and started meeting every time there was a, a fatal collision. So our mandate is to promptly and facilitate the sharing of information between members. It's to better understand the contributing factors of those collisions. So we hear it from the police in terms of what they saw the coroner in terms of whether any medical issues or other things that were in place and from a traffic perspective. And our goal is to develop recommendations for roadway modifications, education uh, campaigns, or um, enforcement campaigns made to prevent. And what we're finding, we've been doing this for five years and our actual annual report's gonna be coming out in the next uh, probably month or two, is that we're starting to see themes and things of things that we're starting to see on our roads that we wouldn't have seen prior to, which then will help us to actually make our roads safer. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank you for the time today. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask the uh, speakers to come up to uh, the stage. We're going to take some questions now. Uh, I remind you that uh, if you're in the room, uh, Brenda has a microphone that uh, she'll bring to you for questions. And Navoda at the back is going to be taking any questions online uh, for the panelists. So why don't we uh, start with a question uh, from in the room. Uh, no, you go ahead. Thank you. It's on, okay, thank you. Sorry, I asked two questions today. I'll shut up now. Um, <laughs> yeah, and the presentations that were showing the uh, the stop signs and the posts that uh, that were being used, and several of you mentioned that on the rural roads. Um, has there been any use in Ontario of using the reflectors on the posts as they do in the United States? One of the most impressive stop signs that I saw was uh, in Ohio, actually, coming off the, uh, the interstate onto a rural road. And they had attached a, the, a reflector the entire length of the stop sign, and it made it extremely visible. Um, I brought that back to our road safety committee, and we did actually do a pilot in the community I represent, which... Um, is not rural, it was just in a neighborhood, we attached some reflectors, the, the strip, to the stop signs. And it made them extremely visible at night because the, the car lights, of course, lit them up. The residents loved it. We, we didn't proceed with it because we had used the, the cheaper tape and everything else. But 
Um, ha has it ever been used in Ontario and has anyone done any research on that? Um, as I, I thought it was just a brilliant idea that was being used and really increased. Uh, I think it was the first gentleman that spoke uh, showing the, the collision, the impact studies. And may, maybe fewer of those posts would be hit if they could be seen. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I could provide a little bit of comment. I've actually driven probably very similar uh, highways down in the US where I've, I've seen the exact same thing and it wasn't just wood. Um, they were also attaching it to uh, like a telescopic perforated post as well. And uh, you're right, they, they light up amazing at night. And uh, I, to my knowledge, and I, I, I can only speak from sort of Mark and I's perspective, I have not seen it used or heavily used in Ontario, but it is something that should be considered because I thought the exact same thing. We, we drive down and around the US quite a bit on our end. And uh, in doing so, we see uh, a, lot of, a lot more reflective material use, particularly uh, with signage as well as within work zones. Yeah, I was just going to add, I think on the, um, on the railway uh, cross buck signs, I believe they use that reflective tape on the post, but I've never seen it used on a stop sign here in Ontario. And the, the, only, the, on <laughs> the only other thing I, I would add as well is um, the other use of reflective material that I've, I've liked to see, and I've seen it used on the 407 in certain locations, are, uh, it's almost like an LDS strip used on the inside of a curve of a concrete barrier. Um, where that actually does light up amazing at night as well. So yeah, there, there are some opportunities where I think we can improve. So it's a great question. Question? Yeah, uh, kind of a question to, to everyone. Uh, and, you know, Michelle, you talked a little bit about the uh, Canadian Shield that we have here in Northern Ontario. Uh, Jesse and Mark, uh, about obviously the the use of roadside safety hardware to, to protect against that. And, and Jeffrey, you're um, auditing uh, here in uh, Northern Ontario. And uh, I, I just wonder if you're interested in a comment regarding uh, the, the amount of, of Canadian Shield that we drive by, particularly on our Northern Ontario roads and, and certainly probably in some areas in Ottawa as well. Um, interested in the sort of, uh, the approach towards protecting drivers against that and what we could do from a roadside safety hardware perspective uh, or what we, you know, other, other aspects. And, and, you know, I know you all have some uh, experience around that. So I'd be interested in some comments around that and the uh, it's particularly an issue here in Northern Ontario. So I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah. Something about that. Um... I mean, when the, uh, the rock cuts down on uh, highway, I guess, old 69, 400 down in uh, Muskoka, I mean, they've got uh, the, the pavement markings for delineation. They've also got shoulder rumble strips. I think that really uh, contributes uh, on the left and on the right side and uh, delineation. And really, I mean, they've really been pulling those rock cuts back with uh, recoverable slopes. So I know those ones down there, I think they've done a, a terrific job down there. I have no idea how the uh, statistics are looking in that corridor, but uh, I know they, they, they really pulled those rock cuts back and they're really well delineated. I can talk for Ottawa in terms of, we don't have the amount of rock like you do up here, um, but we, I know the road 174, which is a four lane road that goes into a, a two lane road in the east end of the city. And we were having lots of collisions and fatalities uh, and there's a river on one side and then there's a rock um, in certain areas. So again, guide rails, we put rumble strips um, and just, uh, you know, paving shoulders and things like that to, to create that um, recovery zone. And, and also putting rumble strips in the middle of the, like on the, on the center line, because we were seeing a lot of uh, head on collisions. So things like that, uh, uh, they were effective on that, uh, on that stretch of road. It just wanted some thoughts on the balance between setting the appropriate speed limit for a particular segment versus um, having the driver collect, you know, uh, six different regulatory regulatory limits within five to 10 kilometers of road. So there are areas in Ontario where you go through 90 followed by 50 followed by 70 followed by 50 for a roundabout followed by 90 again. Um, and unless you're playing bingo, um, it's 
that's difficult for drivers. But on the other hand, you're in these peri-urban areas that are quite different from one kilometer to the next and might deserve different speed limits. So how do you square that? Well, I, I can talk about Ottawa where um, on our rural roads, the uh, majority of the, the speed limits are at 80 kilometers an hour. And, and when we start to reduce the speed limits is when you get into the villages. Uh, and there's actually the, the, the area changes. So you go from farmland to sort of homes so people can see that. And then we see that the, the, uh, the speed limits are more, uh, or the operating speeds are a bit more effective. Now we don't get down to the 50, it's usually 60 to, to 65. Um, but what we have found too is we've had some um, council um, approved reports to reduce speed limits sort of in that area where there is like it's farmland and what the data has shown us is unless there's enforcement, the operating speeds don't slow down and we've actually seen some where the speeds have gone up. We have a stretch along um, a, next, next to the river going south where the speed limit used to be 80 and it went down to 60 and the operating speed was about 85 um, to 90. And it's still 85 to 90. Um, so again, in Ottawa, you know, we, we're trying to lower the speeds, but we want to make sure that it actually is going to occur. So one of our policies we approve, this is more in the in the urban area, uh, all our, our roads will be built and designed to 30 kilometers an hour um, on residential streets, uh, because we also know that putting up a sign that says 30, when you've got a road that's 11 or 12 meters wide, really isn't going to make a difference. Um, and so we want to make sure that people understand um, that when they get onto those type of roads, they need to drive at that speed. And so we want to design our roads to that. Now that's going to take a long time to do because, you know, we probably got about two or 3,000 residential streets in the urban area. Uh, but again, it's a start to do that. And we have reduced speed limits to 30 in certain areas. Um, and what we do is supplement that with some flexible posts or things like that to, to create. We want to do something similar so that as people drive around the city and they see those things, it's not looking at the speed limit sign, the cue from the road, oh yeah, I'm coming into a certain area because what we have found is if you don't do those things, the speed limits don't change. Um, and it's then you get the complaints from residents, we'll do something to change the speeds, but there's only so much we can do when you got a wide road. Except um, it's important that your roads be self-explaining. So if you are, Putting a posted speed, the driver should intuitively know and, and that speed should make sense. Otherwise, you need to put things in place to, to uh, convey a lower operating speed. So changes to the, the road uh, site environment, uh, traffic calming if, if need be. Question before our break. Hi, just a, a question in, and rural roads is a big issue for us, uh, both from a policing standpoint and a political standpoint uh, through York region and Durham region. Um, the MUMS Act um, made, from my perspective, enforcement uh, a lot easier in the sense of uh, giving some immediate uh, action to it. The problem we have in rural settings is uh, from a staffing perspective, when it comes to uh, the township, uh, their concerns are getting work done. So the big call right now is for reducing the 80, which is the usual rural road speed down to 70. Um, the call was for 60, but <laughs> um, we've already indicated that we would only do 70. Um, the staff isn't happy about it from a perspective of getting work done. But um, the MUMS Act is actually, uh, I don't know if people have thought about it this way, and I'm not sure why they decided 80 and above stayed at 50 over and under 80 became the 40 over. But if you change your speed from 80 to 70, you've actually reduced your problem at by 20 kilometers an hour instead of 10, um, based on we can now enforce uh, the 40 over instead of 50 over, which brings your speeds down by 20 overall. Um, which is very helpful from an enforcement standpoint, even though, again, we don't get enforcement as much as we want it. <laughs> but uh, that's just a, a question in regards to how do you interact with the staff concerns over the safety concerns? Um, so in Ottawa, we haven't been requested by the police to reduce speed limits to, to 70. Um, and, and I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier is um, we've got segments in the rural areas where we've reduced speeds to even 60. 
and unless there's always unless there's police enforcement and it's very challenging um you know to monitor there uh those roads that that uh the operating speeds don't really change so from our perspective we we're we're putting our speed limit at, at what the road was operated it's it's a challenge to try to design a rural roadway to a lower speed um and that's why we i mean when you get into sort of the villages you do see those lower speeds because it's more built up and you're creating that friction on the side of the road that that is intuitive to say, well, I need to slow down, I'm coming into there. But when you're in the middle of farmland, um, putting a speed of 70 or 60, unless there's a police officer there, they'll be going 80 or 90. Um, and yeah, just, just to clarify, it's not the police asking for it, it's residents asking for it, the staff. speed the, the speed reduction. Oh. It's not police asking for it, it's, okay. it's residents. Um, but to that point, and I guess the rural areas, and again, this comes to the doctor's point, uh, is there's different road structures in the sense that we're dealing with um, rural roads that go up and down and up and down. They're not flat mm -hmm. and they're 80 right now. And that's hidden driveways, you know, stop sign over the hill, you know, all that type of stuff. So is that the proper speed and how can you enforce that? Or is it easier to enforce 40 over at 70 than it is at 80 because now you're 50 over. Yeah, and I mean, we, we've got some in the West End that's a bit more rolling like that. Uh, and again, it's it's we put warning signs um, and things like that. But again, uh, it goes back to the point where um, the drivers will feel what's comfortable at driving speeds. And on those rural roads, it's it's about 80 to 85. We do see reduced speeds when you've got those type of conditions because people aren't sure what's coming down. Uh, but if it's a flat road, then it, it tends to go higher. Okay, yeah, last comment from the panel, anybody? I think we're uh, coming to an end here. If not, uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for this morning and uh, join me in uh, giving them an applause. Now, I, I, have, I have something for you, so don't leave yet. Um, so it is time for our nutrition break. We are running a bit behind, so I do ask you to uh, grab something to eat or drink uh, out on the solarium and then go to your next uh, meeting room. As you know, there's gonna be three uh, parallel sessions coming up. Um, so uh, also there are uh, posters in the Georgian A room. So if you could just pop in there and have a look at those posters and see what you think. Lunch after the concurrent sessions uh, will be back in this room uh, and starting at 1215. After lunch, there will be three concurrent paper sessions um, and then uh, because we only have an hour for lunch or maybe even a little less, it might be a good idea if you grab your food and went into the room that you're going to be sitting in for the concurrent session this afternoon. Um, with respect to Science North and the banquet tonight, uh, remember that uh, you should try to make an arrangement to get there. It's really too far to walk, I think, anyway. Uh, so you could either uh, link up with somebody who has a vehicle or you could call a taxi company and reserve something uh, for that uh, banquet at the Science Center tonight. Um, you also, you can uh, go on to the conference app. There's actually a phone number there that you can find for taxis. So uh, have your break and then go to uh, the poster session and go to uh, the concurrent sessions after that. Uh, I just wanted to add that the afternoon session after lunch will still be a hard start at 1.15 just to get us back on track. Thanks so much. <clears throat>